So it's Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 4 to 10. And how many of you, how many of you have read Jeremiah, the whole book? Yeah. It's, a, it's a book that you need to know what's going on behind the scenes. Um, it's, it has very nice quotes on it. Um, it has the new covenant in it, that there will be a new covenant. And it has um, the promise that God will put his law in our hearts. Yes, Ezekiel has the same promise. But Jer and Jeremiah and Ezekiel are type of prophets that they are facing death in their face. Let's read the word of God then. The words of Jeremiah, son of Hilkiah, of the priests who were in Anatoth, in the land of Benjamin. To whom the war of the Lord came in the days of King Josiah, son of Ammon, of Judah, in the thirteenth year of his reign. He came also in the days of King Jeholakim, son of Josiah, of Judah. And until the end of the eleventh year of King Zedekiah, son of Josiah, of Judah, until the captivity, captivity of Jerusalem in the fifth month. Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you as prophet to the nations. Then I said, Ah, Lord. And I, and I liked his answer because, Ah, Lord. <laughs> Some, sometimes we, we um, I'm, not, I'm not saying that we shouldn't be like that, but sometimes we want to sound very majestic when we speak to God and uh, and we said, ah, we usually say that to somebody who we know. But to say it to God sounds like awful. But then Jeremiah says, ah, Lord, truly I do not know how to speak, for I am only a boy. Some boys, you don't make them stop speaking. <laughs> but the Lord said to me, do not say I'm only a boy, for you shall go to all whom I send you, and you shall speak whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Does the Lord put on his hand and touch my mouth? And the Lord said to me, Now I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I upon you over nations and over kingdoms, to pluck up and to pull down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. This is the word of the Lord. Before coming today, um, I usually take out my phone when the phone rings and look who's written during the night. If I have some important email, which I had this morning, thank God, finally an important thing came in, <laughs> saying that I get credit for my studies. Thank God, I don't have to spend like $3,000 extra on study, so get credit for something else I did. But, and then I go into Twitter, and Twitter, if, as you know, Twitter is, is a program that you get people who write all the time, put their uh, thoughts, you only have 144 characters, so you have to be very careful what you write. And I have a lot of people, and a lot of news, mainly news I have, and Ed Setzer, one of um, an evangelist, he's in charge of missions in the U.S. From, for the for Crossway, the Southern Baptist um, arm of mission. And he put this thought today. Every Christian is, is either a missionary or an imposter. Every Christian is either a missionary of, or an imposter. Because all of us are supposed to share the gospel of Christ whoever we encounter. If we encounter a Muslim, if we encounter a Hindu, even if we encounter somebody who doesn't speak our language, I remember trying to to say about Jesus to someone who, um, who was Vietnamese and that didn't know English, didn't know Spanish, but was Vietnamese. And I say, God, God, you know, God. 
trying to explain that the gospel means that God loves them and wants to restore their lives. But all of us are called, if we as Protestants, as non-Catholics actually, not Roman Catholics, we believe that we are a kingdom of priests and kings, what is called the priesthood of all believers, that all of us have access to God. None of us have to go to the pastor or the deacon or the leader and ask them, can you please pray to God so I can be healed? Can you please pray to God so God can hear me? No, we have access to God through Jesus. In the name of Jesus, God, I ask you this, this, and that. But part of the priesthood of all believers is that we all have that command upon us to share the gospel. And if you remember in chapter 28 of, of the book of Matthew, which is the classic verse or, 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 or classic text, where it says, um, 28, 16, Now the eleven disciples went to, uh, went to Galilee, the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him. Some doubted, and Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth have been given to me, Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. What you're going to be doing on the Tuesdays, reading Galatians, that making disciples, go make disciples of Swan Hill only and forget about everybody else, of Bern or Kundruk or Victoria or Australia. No, of all nations. And this is a very defined thing to Jews because he's talking to these disciples who were Jews. And the Jews... They, had, they were trying to keep the God of Israel for themselves. They didn't want to share it to anybody. Even today, you have a lot of issues in, in Israel because Christians are not allowed to witness. Christian, if you think that Egypt has been, is being destroyed, uh, Christians have been attacked, well, go to Israel and find out how those Jews that are in front of the wall praying that with the big not not big beers not like as big as mine but <laughs> with big beers with the black hats you see those Jews vandalizing Christian churches because they hate Christianity to a Jew they can put up with another Jew becoming an agnostic a Buddhist but if you become a Christian, to them, that's the last straw. They don't rip their clothes. If, you, if, if somebody becomes an atheist, they're Jewish atheists. There's a society of Jewish atheists. <laughs> they don't mind if you become a Buddhist, but they mind if you become a Christian. So that's how Christianity is facing in Israel. And then Jesus tells these Jews that they have grown up thinking that everybody else, I remember when Jesus says to the Syrophoenician woman, it's not good to give bread to whom? To dogs. Until this day, that's how Jews um, talk about um, non-Jews. And I had a boss, when I was working with my boss, he was a Jewish boss, and, and I think I seen in the sense that I never told him I was a Christian. He paid me more if, because I was a Jew. <laughs> but he said to me, why are, you having, why are you going out with a goy? Goy means a Gentile. Why are you going out with a goy? Don't you find Christian, uh, uh, Jewish women pretty? <laughs> and I mean, actually, I, 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 I didn't continue working with, with this man. But that's the problem that a lot of people have, that the Jews have till, the, till this day. But if you see a lot of Christians have the same problem that Jesus tells us to go to all nations. To all nations. I was talking to some, a group of people, I think I mentioned that before, but I'm going to mention it again. A group of people who I work with, I used to work with uh, back in Kerrang. <laughs> and a lot of you know who I'm talking about. <laughs> I'm not going to say anything but uh, who they are. But... And I asked them, do you do any evangelism to other people other, other than yourselves? And said, no, we only want to evangelize Anglo-Saxon people. We want to keep our community going. And I went, but didn't Jesus send you to all nations? 
So we're so they're doing the same mistake that the Jews were doing. They're going they're not following Christ's commandment to go and preach to all nations. So we all have a call. You have a call. I have a call. In my case, my call is to be a pastor to go where no man has gone before. <laughs> like Star Trek. Being a pastor has I came here to Australia because I felt that I have a calling from God to come here. And God really made it, made it uh, clear that I had a calling. Because when I was, seven, uh, I was 15, they were preaching at the church and they were saying, we're sending missionaries and, and I thought I was going to go to South America speaking Spanish. Uh, I thought, oh, I better go to South America uh, because um, it's, it's just the other side of the hemisphere. And, and the missionaries were coming back from that, my church where I was going to at the time, they said, oh, you know, the Argentinian women are very pretty. So I wanted to go to Argentina to be a missionary. <laughs> but then God put in my heart, for some reason, Australia. And I remember every class I used to, you know, in, I don't know here, but in the U.S., every, every class, every period, you have a your different room, and then you have a globe of the world. So I used to go and say, Lord, please send me here. Lord, please send me here. And for a year and a half, I kept doing that. And at the end of the year and a half, my dad calls me. He's in El Salvador. He's a university teacher, and they were having a civil war, and they were killing people. And he calls, and I call, actually, I call him for, I call my brother for his birthday, and then he, my dad told me, you know, I'm applying to go to Sweden as a refugee. We didn't come on a boat, we came on an airplane. So, so he, I said, no, don't apply to go to Sweden, let's go to Australia. And my dad, actually, I don't know how he fell for it, but he fell for it. <laughs> and he applied to Australia, and I came to Australia as a refugee from the United States of America. <laughs> Which is quite, quite a weird thing. The United Nations pay everything from, right, my ticket from El Salvador all the way to here. Because when I was 15, this man, I was, I was reading my Bible, and this man told me in the bus, he, I was in the bus reading my Bible, and this man came to me, I, know him, I knew him from church, and actually I, I, wasn't, I wasn't that keen of talking to him, because everybody at church saw him as a weird guy. And I was 15, and I was, mm, I don't like this guy. But he came to me, he said, the Lord is telling me that you will go far away, you're not going to pay a cent, you're going to become a pastor, and you're going to become a teacher. And I said, forget you. <laughs> I'm not doing any of that. I want to be a pastor, but I want to be a pastor on my own terms, where I want to, how I want to. I don't want to leave my mom. I don't want to leave my brothers. I don't want to leave my family. I don't want to leave my safety. I want to stay here in the USA. This is the best country on earth. So I thought. <laughs> but God had another plan. And when I came here, and I'll just tell you a bit of my, my testimony. Sydney first, then Melbourne. After leaving a couple of months with the pastor, the pastor moved, and, and I didn't have any family here, and, and he didn't want to give me a place to stay. And when I asked him, why well, have I wronged you? I mean, why don't you want to give me a room to live? And he said, well, because I want to have an office. I need an office. I'm a pastor. I need an office. But the people from church picked me up, and I was living in the back of a church, of the church, a little room, where all the wind came in. <laughs> when at night I saw the big, the big spiders come out. <laughs> I used to, I used to sleep. I used to put like five, four blankets on top of me. I used to put something on my head, and I used to put a heater on, on top, on front of me. And I still, I was like. <laughs> and to take a shower, I didn't have a shower at the church, so I had to go to the toilet. And the toilet was an open, not, not an open door, <laughs> but it had an open door, so I couldn't close it, so it was cold and things. And I used to say, Lord, why do you bring me to this place? Why do you bring me to Australia? Why? Because he wanted to build character in me. That's all. My mouth said, no, I'm going to bring you back because you're suffering, my son. <laughs> I was 18 then. You're suffering, I want you to come back. And then the unthinkable happened. A girl paid attention to me. My wife. <laughs> and my mom said, no, 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 you're not going to come back. If you like a girl, you're never going to come back. But God 
I felt that God ha, 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 had not finished his promises to me, so I had to stay. So that was my excuse to my mom. <laughs> God promised me other things, and I, and I haven't seen them past, come true. So I know that God will be faithful. But, and here I am. I'm 40. I've been here for 22 years. And God has, everything has come to pass. And when Jeremiah was the same thing, he was young, he, he said, but I'm only a boy. The first time they offered me to be a pastor was 22. I said, no, I'm too young. <laughs> I said, I'm too young. I can't be a pastor yet. I don't have experience. So I became a pastor when I was 25. I waited three more years and, and I studied a little bit more and, and said, yes, now I think I can be a pastor. But the calling, in my case, is I have learned that God calls you whatever he needs you. Not when you want to. When, when and the pastor gets a calling, people say, okay, is it good for my children? Does it have any school nearby? Does it have a big shop? Do you do this? Do you do that? A barren, because we're more isolated than, than here, the Swan Hill. When I was leaving, we had some pastors and, and said, so which is the nearest shopping center? Kerrang, which is not a real shopping center. But <laughs> and one of the ladies, one of, I mean, everybody, everybody knows what they're doing. I, I'm not judging. I'm not saying, oh, they, they don't have a calling. No, but one of the wives said, no, I don't want to go because if there's no shopping around, I don't want to be in it. And I heard this preaching from the Southern Baptist uh, Chapel. Once I was listening to it, and he said, Jeremiah had a very hard calling because he was called to preach to a people who were stiff-necked. And God already told, it, told him that they were going to be taken to Babylon because of their sin. And Jeremiah was called to preach to such a people. Some pastors today, if they get a calling and they said, you know, this church is falling down, the church, this church has no hope, yet I think you are the right person to go and preach to them. A lot of pastors will say, are you crazy? I'm not going to go waste my time. And sometimes that, no, that, that not only happens to pastors, that happens to us. Are you crazy? I'm going to talk to this guy about the gospel. He doesn't care. He doesn't want to hear it. I'm not going to waste my time. But it's not your time. It's God's time. You never know when God will speak to this person. You never know what sort of problems this person is going through and may, that may be the right moment. Remember that Jeremiah says that the word of God is like um, ah, I forgot. Hannah, that breaks the rock. It's not you. It's the word of God that's going to break the rock. It's not your education. It's not your your uh, the way you can put, put it into words. Because sometimes you can say to a person, God loves you, and they break down. So Jeremiah says, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, and before you were born, I consecrated you. And this is the same thing that Paul says in Galatians. You're going to find out in Galatians. He says in, in Galatians 1, that God chose me from, from, from the womb, from 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 birth, to preach, to give this message. And God has chosen every single of us here to do the same. And to appoint you a prophet to the nations. Of course, I, I, I'm, I'm sort of a nationalist now for Australia, actually. <laughs> I have a lot of Australian flags, and I, and I have put into my children, we are Aussies. And sometimes they say, yeah, but you have an accent. Yeah, well, it doesn't matter. <laughs> we are Aussies. We love this country that has given us everything. And because we love this country, we want people from, who come from the outside to know why this country is so great. Because it has Christian values. It has Christian foundations. 
That's why we need to preach to those people the gospel. Then I said, ah, Lord, truly I do not know how to speak. For I'm only a boy. I just converted to two days ago, Lord. And I don't know how to speak the gospel. I just know that I'm happy of having Jesus. People who just came to the knowledge of the Lord are easier, are, have a, a, a much more freedom to witness to others than people like you and me who have been in church maybe all our lives. Because they're still with that fire. They're still with that fire. And then the Lord says, do not say I'm only a boy, for you shall go to all whom I send you. Not only to the ones that you like, not only to the ones that you think, that they all receive the message, but to all that you, I send you. And actually, the Greek doesn't say to all who I send you. The Greek says to all, whatever, <laughs> to whatever I send you. Doesn't sound good in English, but that's, in Hebrew, I think it sounds good. <laughs> and you shall speak whatever I command you. Sometimes as pastors, we like to have our pet Talks, you know, we, we if we like eschatology, we like to. I don't know if you know this type of churches, but there are some churches that they only speak about the end times, and there are some churches who only speak about um, uh, speaking in tongues and miracle things, which is good too. And there are some pastors uh, like me <laughs> who like to speak a lot, a lot about first, uh, second temple Judaism. <laughs> You ask me about Second Temple Judaism, I, oh, I'm going to start talking how oh, the Jews believe this and this and this. That's why Jesus says this, because you understand the context and blah, blah, blah. But we have a command to go and preach to the nations that Jesus is Lord and that Jesus saves. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. And sometimes deliverance I only think about missionaries who go to the Amazons. Remember those who were killed? Who went to the Amazons and were killed? The Lord, did the Lord deliver them? Yes, because they went to heaven. Sometimes we think of deliverance like, oh, the Lord is going to save me and the Lord will put me in the pedestal and everybody say, oh, yes, Louis, you have the right word of God. We acknowledge you as the prophet. Nah. A lot of times I've been despised. And you've been despised. A lot of times people, oh, there he comes. Oh, there she comes. We better. Because people don't like to hear the gospel. People don't like to hear that they're sinners and they need salvation. Israel didn't want to hear that. Israel just wanted to hear, God is with us. We have the temple. No one can mess with us. And Jews are still going on like that. Jews, uh, Jews are still, um, they, they are planning to build a new temple. Now, now, the, now the government of Israel is going to give them money to do it. It's giving this agency within Israel money to build a new temple. And somebody asked me, what do you think about it? God doesn't live in temples made of hands anymore. He lives in people's hearts through the Holy Spirit. That's where he wants to live. God doesn't want to be put in a box again, like in the covenant, in the, in the Ark of the Covenant. God doesn't want to be there. Well, God wants to be here, ruling from here to the outside. See, today I appoint you to, I appoint you over nations and over kingdoms to pluck up and to pull down, to destroy and to overthrow. To build and to plant. A lot of preachers and a lot of churches I hear that they, they, they always say to people, you've been chosen, brother and sister. You've been chosen to do great things, to pluck up and to pull down, to destroy and to overthrow. Imagine that in Syria. <laughs> Imagine preaching that in Syria. We've been chosen to overthrow Assad. <laughs> Nobody's crazy enough to say that. <laughs> Yet, our Christian brothers and sisters 
are doing that because they preach that Jesus is Lord. Not Assad. Not the Muslim Brotherhood. Not whoever wins the next election. <laughs> There's only one Lord, Jesus. There's only one. And if we pray, and if we do our job, we're going to plug down. It's not... It's not a triumphalist thing to say that we have this power given by God that we can rule the nations, that we can uh, um, get this prime minister or president into office. Because there are some people here in Australia that are, that, that are like my American friends. It's funny that every, every, single, every single American president that has been coming up since Ronald Reagan is the end of the world. It's the worst president that you ever had. To me, <laughs> Bush was the worst one. <laughs> and then we got Obama. And Obama is the end of the world. He is going to be the Antichrist. Have you heard that? He is going to be the then, then Bush was the Antichrist. Then Clinton was the Antichrist. Then Ronald Reagan. Actually, Ronald Reagan, that's, that's the one who started everything because his name was Ronald Arnold Reagan. Six, six, six. Six letters in each name. So he was the one who started everything and said, oh, he's the Antichrist. You know, he's spending so much money on bombs. And it didn't happen. Then George Bush got a four-year stint. Oh, you know, he went to fight against Iraq, and that's prophecy, and this is the end. Didn't happen. The Bill Clinton, uh, he didn't do much war, but a scandal with Monica. <laughs> so he said, oh, you know, he's the Antichrist. He's, he's the guy who's, uh, who's against morality. Nothing happened. Then George Bush with the towers that came down, that when they were coming down, actually my wife asked me, is that a movie? No, that's real life. I pick up the phone and call my mom. She was okay. He is the end of the world. This is the end coming. The prophecies are coming true. We're still here. It's five years after that, Obama is the worst thing that ever happened to America. Every single president is the worst thing that happened to America depending on who you are talking about. Just like prime ministers. But the law has not called us to say, well, this is the best leader that we have. No, the law has called us to go and preach the gospel to all nations. And by doing that, we're going to pluck up and pull down. We're going to destroy and to overthrow evil. We're destroying the kingdom of Satan if we do what we're called to. Just like what Jeremiah was called to, to preach the word of God. And the last two, to build and to plant. Are we building the kingdom of God in our homes? Are we building the kingdom of God in our church? Are we building the kingdom of God in our country? That's the challenge that we have today. Are we going to be like Jeremiah? Oh, no, 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 I'm too young. I'm too pretty. <laughs> people are going to go against me. If you preach the word of God, people will go against you. But if you don't preach the word of God, God will be against you. Who would you rather have against you? People or God? That's the challenge that Jeremiah faced on his day. This is the challenge that we face today. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we ask that the Holy Spirit may empower us to be bold in our witness to you. And we trust that just as you have promised in your word, in the Gospels, that you, it will be not us, but the Holy Spirit that will talk through us. And we are asked about the faith that we have. And let us be faithful, Lord, not to add anything to our faith that you have given us, but to preach it just as you have given us, given to us in your word, and to pass it along. So we can pluck down, overthrow the kingdom of Satan, and plant that kingdom of heaven. Wherever we go, wherever you send us. In the name of Jesus. Amen.